so when I enter into a relationship with God through Christ and, you know, indeed through the Holy Spirit, um, I do so knowing that this God of classical theism, with all his resources as pure existence itself, seeks to, you know, draw me into to a relationship um, simply for the fact um, that he loves me because I'm a manifestation of the divine essence, which is the good itself. Welcome everyone to today's MA, where we are very pleased to welcome Gavin Kerr. He is, his philosophical work specializes in the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas and in the medieval background of his thought, although he also has interest in metaphysics and epistemology more generally. His books include Aquinas' Way to God, The Proof in De Ante e Essentia, and Aquinas and the Metaphysics of Creation. He also has several published articles. Feel free to add anything, but with that, Welcome, Gavin Kerr. Thanks very much. Great to be here. You know, very privileged to be invited on. You know, I always, I always enjoy doing these things. You know, they're always good cracks. So, yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for for being here. We we do like to have. Um, we've had, of course, a, a variety of uh, guests on to do these sorts of events, and it's great to have people with different sort of philosophical interests and and. Uh, pictures of the world and um, mm. and I think uh, you're the first Thomas we've had on the uh, on so that's something we've been looking forward to nice um, nice good so sort of as a as a uh, preliminary to it the question that I want to get to um, mm. can you in brief describe what the distinction between essence essence and existence is and mm. it's, it's the preliminary is towards the question of understanding how something can be such that its essence is its existence and that's something i want to try to understand mm. but we'll start with the first question yeah yeah so yeah the distinction between essence and existence so um this first comes up in uh thomas's uh career when he writes a little treatise called uh the anti on being in essence and he wrote this at the request of his um uh, fellow Dominicans at Saint Jacques in Paris, uh, while he was what would have been a PhD student, uh, or the equivalent of a PhD student in theology, and uh, Dominican brothers, they did they, they couldn't really understand metaphysics, so he writes this wee uh, text for them. It's about five chapters, or so, sometimes six chapters in some editions. Uh, it's not too long; it's about thirty pages, and in it he goes through basically the metaphysical principles of things, um, uh, the two of the most fundamental being essence and existence. When he's considering the essence of a thing considers, you know, different candidates uh, for the essence of a thing, matter alone, form alone, some sort of third thing beyond matter and form. Thomas ends up um, arguing <clears throat> that the essence of the thing is uh, what the thing is or what it is to be the thing. That's signified by the definition of the thing. He's assuming epistemic realism here that we can have, you know, sort of real definitions, not just nominal definitions of the thing. And uh, these come about when we know the thing in terms of what it is. So the uh, definitional content of the thing, what the definition latches on to, that signifies the essence of the thing. Thomas holds that that's not reducible to matter alone nor to form alone, but it's the composite unity of matter and form. That's what the essence of the thing is. So the thing is the kind of thing that it is in terms of its essence. But then when he gets to chapter four, the, the infamous chapter four, considering, well, look, you know, matter is a principle of potency in things. So things have certain potentialities um, because they're material. So for example, you know, if you take a block of marble, it stands in potency to being carved into say a statue of David or a Pieta or, you know, a floor tile or a column or something like that. It stands in potency to taking on any form. So it's the materiality of the thing itself, uh, which is a principle of potency. But he wants to know in chapter four, is it the principle of potency? It's certainly a principle of potency. He wants to know, is it the principle of potency such that there's no more fundamental potency to it? And then correspondingly, um, is its corresponding principle of actuality, i.e. form, the principle of actuality? Or is there any more fundamental principle of act? So in chapter four, he's addressing this question. He addresses it in the context of immaterial substances or immaterial creatures. So... Um, you take, you know, the possibility that there could be immaterial creatures, you know, metaphysical principles that we're dealing with here need to apply to those just as much as they apply to material creatures. 
In other words, if there were such immaterial things, they would have to be, they would have to be analyzable in terms of our metaphysics just as much as material things. And so the question then is that, you know, given the possibility of such things, would they have to be material if they um, have potency? And some philosophers hailed that, um, yes, immaterial things would be material. It's just that they would have a kind of materiality, which is incorporeal. So the physical things that we see around us, you know, they're, they're corporeally material. And then, uh, you know, if, if there are, you know, immaterial substances, then they would be incorporeally material. And that's a position which seemed to be defended by the Franciscan theologians. And, and arguably one can find uh, a defense of that. Latin Avicenna, uh, the Islamic philosopher. Um, but now Thomas rejects this position. Um, he, he rejects it for several reasons. He thinks primarily it's ad hoc um, that, you know, the, the, the notion of a, a kind of an immaterial incorporeal matter um, is just, it, it's trying to take care of a problem um, by just reacting to the problem and not, uh, you know, uh, having a principled approach to dealing with the, the possibility, you know, of immaterial things. The deeper point is whether or not matter is the fundamental principle of potency or whether or not there's uh, something more fundamental. And this is what um, sort of motivates him to introduce the distinction between essence and existence. Because what he's going to argue when he makes the distinction between essence and existence is that whilst you know matter is a fundamental principle of potency, it's not the fundamental principle, that essence is the fundamental principle of potency. And essence can be either material or immaterial. Um, and it stands to, you know, it stands in potency to a corresponding um, principle of actuality, which is the act of existence, which itself then is more fundamental than form as a principle of actuality correlative to matter. That's the context for setting up uh, the distinction between essence and existence. And so after he sets up that context, he then gets into uh, the argumentation for the distinction between essence and existence. So um, how is that for an opening sort of, you know, uh, salvo? It's very good. Yeah, a lot, a lot to, uh, a lot to parse there. Sorry, um, mm. just sort of a brief question as an aside. Um, you mentioned actually there are two things I wanted to to talk about briefly. Um, mm. You talked about a sort of real definition first, like a nominal definition. Um, mm. I, I think I have a sense of what that difference is supposed to be, but can you sort of like ex expound uh, upon that a little bit? And why that the the real definition is is critical here? Yeah, so I mean, it's probably best to begin um, with uh, some examples. So, um, real definition is uh, you know the definition or you know isolates the nature of the thing as it is in and of itself, irrespective of um, how the thing relates to us. Whereas a nominal definition would uh, try to define the thing uh, with regard to how it relates to us. So you think of an example, take some, you know, sort of element on the periodic table, you know, sort of gold or something like that. And the nominal definition of gold would be something like it, it, it's a malleable metal, it's, it's yellowish in color, it has a certain glint in the sunlight and so on and so forth. Whereas a real definition of gold would set all that aside because it's all response dependent on the subject and would, would define gold in terms say, of its atomic mass or atomic number. And so that's how we can pinpoint, you know, gold then in relation to other elements, irrespective of how it appears to uh, a knowing subject. And so a, a real definition would be something like that, you know, sort of defining gold in terms of its atomic mass and number, something that's essential to it. Uh, whereas a nominal definition would define it in terms of uh, how it relates to us, how, how we would respond to it. And uh, this sort of captures features of the thing only in terms of uh, how we respond to it. So, uh, how does that sound? Yeah, fair enough. What if, couldn't we say that those are, in an important sense, different definitions in that what satisfies the first one, like what the extension of that could be, could be different than what satisfies the second one. Because like what it is that has those, say, perceptual qualities, for example, might not have been something that has those atomic or chemical qualities. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Those perceptual qualities can be could be produced independently of the thing that has, you know, those those real, say, atomic qualities. And so a, a real definition tries to latch on to the reality of the thing, um, whereas a, a nominal definition just tries to, you know, latch on to something about the thing insofar as it produces a response in us. Yeah. Right. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I had a second 
question about something that you had already said. Um, so you, you talked about <clears throat> sort of taking these metaphysical principles and applying them generally. Um, but what if we think that, look, we, we generate these principles regarding um, matter and form by observing a material world and, and uh, sort of theorizing about it. But why think that this is a principle of metaphysics rather than a principle of, say, physics or material stuff? Uh, I.e., why generalize it to this in a stronger way? So, I mean, that, that brings in the good question about, you know, the different formal um, objects of uh, physics and uh, metaphysics. So, um, for Thomas, um, and I would defend this uh, position as well in metaphysics, what the metaphysician considers is just um, what it is to be. Okay, so, so the being of things, uh, so that without which a thing cannot right. be. Um, so there's no need to sort of have access to some sort of metaphysical being or, or some sort of immaterial being or to tune oneself in to a pri some sort of private domain. Rather, it's simply to think about the medium-sized dry goods in front of us in terms of that without which they would not be. And that's what the metaphysician does. And so in considering things in terms of their matter and form, sure, we're, you know, we're looking at material things, but we're trying to pick out those different categories um, by which we understand those things in terms of what it is for them to be, such that if, he, if they didn't, you know, fall within these categories, um, they would be nothing. And, you know, th those categories, you know, they extend um, to physical things, but, um, you know, uh, they, they can also have a, an, an extension to non-physical things. Let's say, you know, something like the category of form, if non-physical things exist. So when it comes to the formal object of metaphysics, then um, it, it's just taking a certain focus on the things that we see around us and then just trying to tease out um, the categories, um, the, the categories without which uh, we would, they would not be. Uh, so, so the point is that it's not some sort of induction or something or something based merely on observations of physical things, but a sort of metaphysical theorizing going on in the background that also applies to those things, but it's not. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. It's kind of like, you know, sort of entering sort of a way of thinking or, or, or a frame of thinking um, whereby you, you see the objects in front of you, but you, you think about them in a certain way. Um, the, the example I, I always like to give um, to my students is that um, a mathematician and a physicist, they, they, they can both be looking at the same objects, but there, there's a different sort of intellectual focus on the objects. One is thinking about it in terms of, you know, its quantifiable features, and the other is thinking uh, of the object in terms of both, you know, its quantifiable and qualifiable features. Um, uh, but they're both sort of thinking about the, the, the same object with a different point yeah. of view, and the metaphysician is doing the same. So there's not kind of this sort of tuning into any sort of private metaphysical domain. All right, great. So I think maybe that's enough groundwork to sort of get to my the, the question that I was looking to get to is in which was how to understand uh, the view that something could have its existence which is identical to its essence. What does that? Yeah. What does that entail? Yeah. And what does that mean? yeah. Okay. So I mean. So, I mean, what 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 angle do you want to do you want to tackle this from? I mean, should we maybe consider what it is for essence and existence to be composed? Things in which essence and existence are distinct, and then and then go go to that in which essence and existence are identical. Would you like to go to, go in that sure, direction? Sure, that, that could work. Yeah, as a as a sort of way in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, with the distinction of essence and existence in place, and you know, there's you know all the different formal arguments for distinction of essence and existence. Aquinas mm -hmm. argues that these are composed as act and potency. Um, so, um, the essence and existence are united, you know, as potency and act. So, essence stands um, to existence. Um, it, it stands to existence to be actualized. The, the essence would not be um, were it not to have um, the act of existence composed with it. And when the act of existence composes um, with the essence of the thing, it's uh, limited uh, to that essence. It's that essence which exists and not some other essence. So it's that essence which is actualized and not some other essence. So the the essence as a, di as a distinct receiving potency limits um, the act of existence that it has. So my, my act of existence is distinct from my wife's, which is distinct from my cat's and all the other substances around me. So existence then uh, is limited um, by the essence as a distinct um, receiving potency. Um, 
the comes then, so when, when you get into the argument, you know, for the existence of God and, you know, um, the, the, the whole denial of an infinite regress of a certain kind of causal series, uh, the conception of a primary cause here is um, something that has the causal efficacy of, of the series of which it is the prim primary in itself in virtue of what it is. Um, so that, that's distinct from a per first cause. This is what's uh, sort of considered to be a primary cause. And the, the, the sort of causal series that, you know, Thomas considers is one in which um, the causal, the causal actuality in question is that of existence. So the primary cause of that then is uh, something that um, has the causality of existence in itself in virtue of what it is. So the primary cause then of existence is something that has existence in virtue of what it is. But the thing is, in having an existence in virtue of what it is, it can't have it as any distinct um, sort of uh, metaphysical principle because then essence and existence would be distinct in it and it would be one of the things then um, requiring some sort of you know cause for its existence. When having the causal efficacy or the, co or the causal actuality of the series of which it is the primary cause in itself, its essence has to be its existence, I, its essence has to be identical to its existence being so identical to its existence so what it is is just existence itself um its existence is not limited to any essence um which receives it as a distinct limiting potency so in contrast to um things in which essence and existence are distinct and composed um this primary cause then um doesn't have you know an act of existence distinct from its essence which essence limits it it just is pure existence itself so how are we there then? Do, do you want to start, you know, sort of teasing that out? Yeah, so I think... I sort of, sorry. <laughs> I think I sort of understand right. some of the, the arguments for thinking that uh, there is something which is uh, mm. has an essence as an existence as its essence. But I'm not sure that's really getting at what um, my concern is in, in that I'm not sure really what's being said when there is such a thing. I mean, we can mm -hmm. give the same terminology, but I mean, intuitively, when I think about things, um, mm -hmm. I think of the different qualities they have, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and for something to have those qualities, sort of definitive of that thing, is just what it is for that thing to exist. But if you just say, uh, "Here's the only quality that the thing has to have is its existence." It sounds almost like empty. You're just saying that there is this existence, pure existence or something, but you're not really telling me what it is that exists in a way. Maybe do you kind of understand the, the intuition. Maybe where do I go? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, th I think maybe the issue here is thinking of things in terms of their qualities and, you know, for them to exist is to have those qualities. So um, given the distinction between essence and existence, the thing certainly has qualities, properties, characteristics. Some of them which it has the result of what it is, i.e. its essence, and some of them that it has, you know, accidentally is a result of some extrinsic causes. But that's not what it is uh, for a thing to exist. For for a thing to exist is for its essence to be to be actual, to be real in the world, i.e. to have an active existence. So what you have is that you have, a, you know, an existing substance with its active existence. Now, when we say that, you know, this primary cause is pure existence itself, what we're saying is that this primary cause it's just that it's just that by which anything is at all, except it doesn't have, you know, this as a distinct act of existence actuating its essence. It is just pure existence itself. Now we can tease out what it is to be pure existence itself, um, because to be pure existence itself entails, you know, to be utterly simple, good, omniscient, omnipotent, um, all the rest of it. So we can make true affirmations about this um, in, in virtue of its being pure existence itself. So um, it's important to distinguish here that uh, when we talk about existence, we're not talking about um, existence in terms of just, you know, instantiation or existence in terms of, you know, the truth of a proposition. We're talking about some, you know, real uh, metaphysical feature of the thing by which, you know, um, we can say, you know, that you, we, we can have the truth of a proposition or, you know, that we can say that something is instantiated. So um, we're, we're, we're talking in terms of metaphysical principles and not just, you know, existence as, you know, fact or occurrence, let's say. Right. Um, so I think I think I'll come back to that. I, I do have some more questions about those those other properties that we can uh, yeah. attribute to this sort of thing. But I'll, I'll, sure. I'll go to some of the questions in the in the chat first. So uh, if Jonathan is here, 
Uh, if you want to go to VC, you can ask your question. Otherwise, I can just ask it for you. I'm here. Yeah. Can you uh, hear me? All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, what's up, Gavin? Uh, I was just. I had two questions. Yeah. One is. Um, well, I'll just I'll just ask them both. Uh, so the, the first one is, if you have any particular arguments or reasons to think that, like to favor a realist account of essences or mm. a moderate realist account of essences over like an anti-realist or nominalist account. But my second yeah. question was more about the incarnation. So obviously in mm. Catholic theology, Christ assumed a human soul and body. And mm. um, Ryan Mullins kind of gave this objection that it doesn't really make sense to say that Christ is one person who has uh, a soul and a divine mind, something like a divine mind from all eternity, because then it would seem like God is bringing into existence like a new subject that undergoes um, suffering at the cross. And it's not really uh, God, the son or the logos. It's rather this like created human subject. So I was wondering what you kind of thought about that objection. And that was basically my two questions. Yeah. Okay. So let me address the first um, one first. So just on real essences as opposed to the nominalist or anti-realist account. So <clears throat> the, um, okay. So the, the, the nominalist um, sort of rejection of essences, you know, that's, that sort of comes up, you know, in late medi medieval nominalism with the, um, the, the, the sort of new, you know, semantic and logical framework uh, for referring to things in the world. So on the, on, on the old sort of frame, semantical framework, whenever I sort of refer to things in the world, I refer to things in terms of a common need. Nature, um, uh, by means of which, you know, I can you know, grasp um, the individual thing um, in the world that I'm thinking about. So if I, you know, seek to, you know, refer to like an individual tree in the world, um, I get, I do so by means of some sort of common nature, you know, it's treeness, um, uh, by which I, you know, can think about, you know, intend, grasp, uh, the tree, which is there before me. But the, the, the nominalists, you know, led by Occam and then his followers held that, uh, that common nature by means of which, um, I pick out, you know, the tree in the world um, is identical in reference to the uh, the individual tree itself. And so what's common about it is not anything um, within the individual substance itself, say a form or anything like that. It's some conceptual content that I have in my intellect, um, which I sort of form, you know, these nomina, which I sort of form and which help me, you know, easily sort of uh, group um uh, things which appear to be the same let's say lots of different trees under this you know sort of one sort of concept or conceptual content but that's not anything real in the world that's not like a real form in the world by means of which um my thought my thought about the world can be mediated rather that's that's something sort of behind the veil within my mind by means of which i can categorize things together so what happens then is you get a disjunction um between the goings on in the world which um, are non-conceptual, um, non-universal, there's no universal or conceptual content in the world. All conceptual content or universal content is behind um, a veil, a mental sort of veil. And then um, that sort of gets radicalized within the Cartesian project because the Cartesian project starts off on the presupposition that there is um, this division between mind and world. And precisely because there is such a division between mind and world, Descartes sees it as a problem. How do I know that the representations coming from the world into my mind are reliable? That's what sort of drives the methodic doubt, this presupposition that there's a separation uh, between mind and world. That drives the methodic doubt, and then that drives uh, Descartes down the road, um, you know, th that he goes. That's a characteristic of modern philosophy more generally. I think a good historical project would be to show the influence of uh, medieval nominalism on modern philosophy and the modern philosophy view of the self as an isolated, standalone, private entity independent from the world. I know Etienne Gilson did his doctoral thesis on the, you know, medieval influences on Descartes' thought. And, you know, you see, you know, how he traces the line of some of the medieval nominalists to Descartes. I think wider project, just looking at modernity as a whole, would be good to do that. Now, the point that I'm making here is that that sort of anti-realist position is driven by a more fundamental philosophical anthropology in which the person or, you know, the the, the intelligence, the intellect of the person seemed to be locatable somewhere, let's say, in a mind. Um, and then once you locate intellection or intelligence in some sort of place, a in a mind or in a brain or something like that, 
The problem is always going to be, how do you cross that bridge? Okay, so how, how do you cross that gap between mind and world? So um, later philosophers sort of argued, well, you know, really, what sort of happens here is that, you know, the mind is sort of, you know, going about in its own realm of spontaneity, doing its own thing, and then the world sort of impresses upon it in a causal fashion so that we can say, you know, this is in traditional empiricism, you know, held this view, so that we can say that, you know, the thinking that I have going on in my mind is justified by, you know, the, the, the causal impingements of the world upon me. So I can point out, um, I, I can point to, you know, items in the world which justify my thinking uh, about those items, uh, you know, in my thoughts. Now, what I think, you know, has been, you know, probably one of the strengths of the the German idealist uh, tradition in contemporary analytic philosophy as it's been re-embraced, pointing out the fact that if we separate the content of intelligence from the content of experience, okay, so if we separate those out such that there's a heterogeneity between the content of intelligence, which is conceptual, and the content of experience, which is non-conceptual, given that they're heterogeneous, the content of experience, what we can experience, can never justify the content of thought, precisely because the content of experience is non-conceptual and the content of thought is conceptual. Justifications, when we look for justifications for something, we are looking to, you know, justify, you know, what we believe, you know, or give some sort of a judgment, you know, that the belief of X is justified because of well, whatever, we're looking, you know, for some sort of rational justifications, whereas the content of experience, precisely because it's non-conceptual, isn't rational, in which case it can't be used uh, to justify the content of thought. So the, the, um, our, our modern analytic philosophers, infl influenced by the German idealist uh, position, kind of went back to something that Kant said, you know, a very sort of pregnant phrase at the start of the you know, first critique of pure reason. That, okay, so I'm just going to download it from memory, that um, intuitions without concepts are blind, concepts without intuitions are empty. In other words, if you have an intuition which isn't conceptual, which isn't already conceptual, which, does, which doesn't already carry conceptual content, it's blind, it's empty, it's in darkness. It doesn't convey anything. Kant's point is that the content of intuition is the content of intelligence. Okay, so that all such content is conceptual. And in it being so conceptual, we can have thoughts um, about that content of intuition. In other words, we can have we, we can think about the content of perceptual experience. So how do we go then about affirming that there are real essences in the world? We do so by you know asking the question, does the content of perception justify our thought? Do we want to do we want the content of perception to play a justifying role in thought? If we do want the content of perception to play a justifying role in thought, which I which I think you know modern empiricists and you know modern rationalists um, you know would want to agree with, if that is the case for uh, perceptual experience to play a justify to play a justifying role in thought, there has to be some sort of content, conceptual content to perceptual experience. So it's not just the case that you know I hear sound waves, I hear bird song. The sound waves are formed, and I hear it as formed. And then I can come to appreciate it, understand it as formed. So that when I have a perceptual experience, some sort of perceptual experience of the world, that perce perceptual experience is conceptually loaded. Uh, so the content which I derive from the world is some sort of conceptual or formed content. And it's that formed content which signifies the real essence in the world. So that's that's how I would go about um, making the argument that there are real essences or real conceptual content within the world, which brings into operation um, our you know, conceptual episodes in us by means of which we can uh, understand it. So, um, Jonathan, how is that as an initial um, response to your first question? Yeah, that's not. Yeah, that was that was great, and I I appreciate like the sort of historical analysis. And so, if I'm getting it right, the idea would be that to assume a sort of anti-realist picture of essences is to take a certain view of the nature of the intellect in relation to the world that you think is untenable. And so you would have to say there is like a real thing in the world that our concepts are latching onto. Is that kind of the idea? Yeah. yeah. Plus I would say that we're owed from those, uh, you know, sort of an anti-realist and anomalous, we're owed some sort of justification for their, their, their anthropology. So for their view of mindedness, um, such a justification usually is, is either just presupposed or it's denied outright from the beginning because, you know, some sort of, you know, radical skepticism or methodic doubt is assumed from the beginning. So I, I would add that as well. Yeah.
So it would kind of, you would say it almost kind of leads to a sort of skepticism about the external world. Is that, is that kind of right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think that once you buy into that sort of philosophical anthropology, you're, you're ultimately led to, you know, total skepticism and, I don't. I don't think the best way to address skepticism is to, you know, buy the same starting point as the skeptic, as to uh, as the skeptic as to the nature of mentality. I think, you know, uh, we, you know, you you have to defend an account of mentality by which the skeptical problem can be respectfully set aside. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate the answer. And um, did you do you remember the um, the incarnation question was kind of muddled? Do you kind of remember what I was getting at? Yeah, so so bring it out, feed it back to me. You mentioned Mullins. Um, I've only read a few bits and pieces by Mullins, uh, more philosophical. So if you, if you feed back the question back to me, I'll, I'll attempt a response. Yeah, that, that's my bad, because it's kind of, he did it in like a video, so it's, I'm kind of trying to crunch his words. Um, mm -hmm. I, yeah. Well, then let's not, attri let, yeah, let's not attribute it to him. Let's just, you know, get the question, you yeah, know, the, the question. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Um, the idea is like, since Christ assumed a rational soul in the incarnation, but he also has a divine mind from eternity, it kind of <laughs> may, it's not really God, the son that like undergoes suffering on the cross, like mental suffering or like emotion, <laughs> emotions in this human nature, because you're essentially yeah. to existence, another subject that feels these emotions, <laughs> but it's not actually the divine mind of God from all eternity. And that might motivate yeah. someone <laughs> like to take like Craig's view where, which is like an Apollinarian view. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So, I mean, setting aside uh, Mullins is the author of this because, I mean, um, as we're saying, you know, kind of not really sort of knowing um, the actual paternity. We'll, we'll, we'll set Mullins aside here. And so we'll kind of just address uh, the issue. Um, I think it turns on uh, what you take a subject to be, a personal subject to be. And this maybe sort of ties in with the previous question because. There is a view that um, to be a subject is to be a mind or to, to be minded in some sort of way. Um, and if, if one is a mind or if one is some sort of rational intellect, um, then one is a subject. Um, that, that's a sort of a, a, a view of the human. That's a view of the person that I wouldn't accept. Um, I would hold that um, a person is certainly a subject and a person is a subject that has a mind and, you know, kissing myself you know or has mentality and uh has a body and you know has all the you know the, the features of rational mentality but i'm not identical um to my mentality so i i'm an i'm an individual subject um which has mentality and has bodiliness and all the rest but i'm not identical to that mentality so the subject that i am isn't um you know say the rational soul or the body which is informed by the rational soul the rational soul and the body are realized in me as the individual subject that I am. If that's the account then, if, if that's what the account, you know, of the personal subject is, then the body and the rational soul in Christ isn't the person. Rather, the person, um, you know, the second person of the Trinity, which, you know, supposits for um, that um, rational soul and body, is the one which is the subject of that rational soul and body. So whatever goes on in that rational soul and body is, you know, something that, you know, the subject, you know, the second person of the Trinity uh, is, is something that the personal subject goes through. Whilst at the same time, you know, that personal subject subsists in its divine nature as well. So it's so a long, you know, Chalcedonian Christology, you know, you keep separate the human and the divine nature. So the rational soul and the body, they don't, uh, you know, they don't come into composition with the divine nature. Rather, the second person of the Trinity subsists in the divine nature and subsists uh, in the rational soul and body. So on that account then, given that, you know, the mind or um, mentality is not identical to a personal subject, you can have a personal subject which, you know, supposits for um, that rational soul and body and so um, undergoes everything that that uh, uh, rational soul and body undergoes. So that that's... I mean, not being an expert in Christology, that's kind of how I would go with that one. Yeah, I, I appreciate the answers, Gavin, and I um I don't have any more, but I I appreciate the answer, and I hope to see more of your work in the future. Okay, th well, thanks very much for the questions. They were cool. Awesome. So I think we'll move on to some other uh, sorts of questions. Um, mm. So, um, yeah. So the question I'm I'm, I'm looking at is, suppose we. Uh, grant that we have some 
purely actual thing or something which is purely actual how do we get from there to um making certain attributions to it mm. of other properties uh say of omniscience mentality yeah. and so forth yeah 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 cool so um yeah that, that, that this is awesome stuff um so um have you know pure existence itself pure actuality right and so what thomas does when he usually deduces the um you know the di the different di divine attributes is that he he points out that um okay we don't have any sort of direct insight into you know god's essence itself you know that's the whole um incomprehensibility of god's essence right. you know we can apprehend something about god's essence and all the rest you know even if we were right in front of god's essence but we have no direct insight into it so what do we do then we deduce from what we do know about God as primary cause, pure existence itself, um, what it is like to be pure existence itself. In other words, what follows from that? So if you have pure existence itself, what would that be like? Okay, how, how could you characterize that? That's what the different divine attributes um, signify. Um, so, I mean, what Thomas does, it's the, it's the classic philosopher's distinction, is uh, he distinguishes between the sense and the reference of the attributes that he's, um, you know, about to put across. Mm. So you have these different, you know, sort of divine attributes, all distinct in sense. So distinct sort of conceptual contents by which we can understand them, but identical references. And uh, so, I mean, if any of your listeners um, are unaware of the distinction between sense and reference, so, sorry, I don't know what the makeup of your listeners are. So uh, oh, I, really, I really hope I'm not, you know, patronizing or anything like that. Uh, you know, uh, the basic ex example of distinction of sense and reference is the morning star and the evening star. So the morning star right. is the, um, isn't it? It's the last star you see in the morning and the evening star is the first star you see in the evening. Um, in reality, that's one and the same thing, which is uh, planet Venus or, or another example I like to use with the students is the breakfast table and the dinner table. So different sort of senses, but uh, they refer to one in the same table, unless you're lucky enough to have two tables for breakfast and dinner. Um, so that's the distinction in sense, um, identity and reference. And Thomas then, you know, in, w with that in place, then he just asks, well, look, what would it be like to be pure existence itself? And the first thing he argues for, uh, would you like to go through, would you like me to go through some of the, the attributes? Sure. Uh, yeah. If that's all right. <laughs> Yeah, not a problem. So the first thing he argues for is um, the utter simplicity of uh, pure existence itself. And the reason why he argues uh, for the utter simplicity of pure existence itself is what, what it comes down to is that there is no potency within it, or, or there's nothing in it to which it stands in potency because it is pure existence itself. In other words, it simply is what it is to be um and since you know existence is the act of all acts that's without which there is no actuality since it is just that then there is nothing in it which stands in potency to be actualized and there is nothing extrinsic to it to which it stands in potency so everything then stands in potency to it it stands in potency to nothing and since it is just you know the act of all acts as pure existence um there there, there is no potency then um within it and so it can't be composed in any sort of way because um, a basic condition of composition is some sort of potency which is actualized in some respect. So he infers then uh, that in virtue of being pure existence must be utterly simple. Should we go on from that? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's that's very good. And and maybe just one on omniscience and then I have a follow-up on God's knowledge mm -hmm. from, from Kayak in the chat. Yeah. Enough. You you want me to get the uh, do you want me to just jump over to omniscience? Is that is that what you yeah. would like? Yeah, uh, okay, if that's all right. Yeah. Okay, okay, good. So that sort of reasoning that we saw about simplicity, Thomas uses it, you know, similarly, you know, for for God's goodness, for God's immutability, for God's eternity, and all the rest. But if we're going to get down then to um, omniscience, first of all, he he needs to establish um, that this thing, which is pure existence itself, is intelligent in some sort of way. It has an intellect. And then in terms of having an intellect, he wants to argue, you know, well, I mean, what is it for this thing to know? Okay, so, so I mean, it doesn't know in the way that we know or the way that, you know, let's say the angels of Christian and Jewish theology know. How, you know, what way does it know? So first of all, he, start, he establishes that it has an intellect. Well, how does he do that? He asks or he considers, you know, well, what is it to understand something? This kind of came up earlier. Um, he reasons that to understand something is to possess the forms of things distinct from oneself in oneself without becoming those things. 
It's to possess the form of something distinct from oneself in oneself without becoming that thing. Here's an example. You have a tree. I always like using the example of a tree. You have a tree, right? And it has, you know, the form of treeness, that by which it is a tree. Now, if it is given a new form, let's say it's, you know, cut down and turned into a door or something like that, it's no longer a tree okay, because a, a tree is a living thing. Now it's been cut down and been given a different form. It's lost the form that it had. It's, you know, now just a, you know, a chunk of wood and it's been turned into a door. Whereas um, something which is intelligent can receive the forms of this things distinct from it, from itself without ceasing to be the th sort of thing that it is. So, I mean, I can, you know, sort of understand by means of the form, by means of form, all the different things distinct from me, but I don't actually become any of those things. I don't cease to be a human substance and become, you know, a tree that I understand or an elephant that I understand or anything like that. So a mark of intelligence then is the possession of forms distinct from oneself without becoming those things. And it asks, Thomas asks them, well, what about pure existence itself? Does pure existence itself have the forms of things distinct from itself without becoming any of those things? And Thomas answers yes, because if it's pure existence itself, then the forms of anything which could possibly be contained primordially within it, because anything which could possibly be, any form of existence, is in some way in pure existence itself, some way primordially in it. Because everything which exists or could exist is just some sort of manifestation or similitude of that which is pure existence itself. They must all in some sort of way be in it primordially. Given that he already kind of has in place that, you know, um, God is simple and, muta and immutable and all the rest, the only way in which pure existence itself could have all the forms of anything which could possibly be in itself um, would be would be in such a way that it doesn't lose its simplicity and its immutability. So it would have to have the forms of everything distinct from itself in itself without ceasing to be pure existence itself, without ceasing to be what it is. And that's what intelligent things are like. Intelligent things have forms of things distinct from themselves in themselves without becoming any of those things. So he reasons then that because the forms of anything which could possibly be are in pure existence itself. Um, without it ceasing to be pure existence itself, they must be in it in an intelligent fashion. Now, just what that intelligent fashion is, you know, we, we get on to that. But that's the um, reasoning for um, pure existence itself being intelligent. We would like to go on and sort of tease out how you know that works. No, no, that, that's very helpful. I'll just have like. I have one quick follow-up on that, and then there was another question on God's knowledge in particular from mm. Kayak. But so on, and then we'll get to David Lee Roth in, in a couple minutes. Um, mm. When you say that the thing, it must have in some way the mm. um, form in it within itself, it, it, it sounds like you're invoking the sort of uh, the causal principle or something that um, whatever is in the effect um, must be in some way in the in the cause, and I'm what something like that. I think you have in mind. Maybe you can correct me on that. But I, I take it then. Why do we think that we could grant that that um, in this with that which is purely actual, um, these forms are in some sense within that thing, but why would they have to be in it in this sort of way that the as as part of like an intellect? Um, Seems like that's an extra step, if you get where I'm coming from. Because remember, prior to establishing that God is intelligent, you know, Thomas establishes that he's simple and immutable. Um, and if he's simple and immutable, then he doesn't have the forms in himself in a non-simple, in, in a composite way, or an immutable sort of way. He must have them in a simple, uh, immutable sort of way. And In which case, having the forms in himself he doesn't have them in a multi sort of faceted way, which be a threat to his simplicity or his immutability. And so he doesn't cease, he, he doesn't cease to be himself in having the forms of things distinct from himself. He still remains himself. And that's what it is to be intelligent, to have those forms of things distinct from oneself and still uh, uh, remain you know, to be oneself. That does that sort of click? <laughs> I, I think other. I think I'm I think I'm understanding the 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 point. Yeah. So there um right. 
I guess there would be a few ways to go and follow up, but I, I do want to get to to Kayak's question about God's knowledge. Um, okay. Yeah. Where he's wondering, well, do you have a? Uh, actually, I'll read it as he posts it. He says, "How would you handle the <laughs> contingent uh, modal problem? And if you were to take an extrinsic model of God's knowledge, would you say that God's extrinsic knowledge is supervened on His choices?" Um, of choosing which possible world is actual. Um, I yeah. guess I could follow up on that if that's not clear. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. So I think, I mean, the, this whole question um, generally does, it, it doesn't arise for Thomas, given the, the way he's very careful, um, not only in setting up his whole metaphysics of creation, but in setting up, you know, his whole account of uh, God's knowledge. Um, first of all, Thomas just doesn't use possible worlds, metaphysics, at all right uh, and so the idea of choosing between this and that possible world is it's it's actually it's, it's actually a view that um thomas uh took issue with um you find it in the latin avicenna and so the latin avicenna held that you know there, there's three ways in which an essence exists um in the thing in the mind and in itself okay so so essence has a sort of reality distinct from the mind and in the thing and it's this sort of you know third realm the realm of possibility you know that that avicenna um you know kind of held up as to be you know essence and its purity and and that's a sort of position i mean this is just an aside but that's a sort of position i mean thomas thomas rejected that uh, now i mean there is some you know discussion amongst thomas you know, the essence has absolutely considered you know distinct from mental and real existence there is you know argument there you know myself and john nassis go back and for, uh, forth on that um but in general thomas he, he really just he, do, he doesn't go in for this modal method physics and um, get some reason for that in, in the 2015 book and you know we but i'm sorry that's just a tangent so i mean how do i want to address this sort of question so god's knowledge when we say that you know sort of god has knowledge and and this follows on from you know god's being intelligent if he is intelligent what does he have knowledge of he can't have knowledge the, the, the direct object of his knowledge can't be anything outside of himself because outside of himself, there is nothing and anything, you know, distinct from himself is, you know, what he has created. Presumably, he has knowledge of, of what he created prior to creating it. So in which case, the things that he creates can't be the cause of his knowledge. You know, the way we go about in the world and we see things and they, you know, um, in the appropriate sort of circumstances, they bring about our knowledge. With our cooperation of it. Well, that can't be the case for God, because that would mean make God dependent uh, and therefore stand in potency um, to his object of knowledge. So what, what is the object of God's knowledge? Well, the only thing that could be the object of God's knowledge is that which he doesn't stand in potency to, okay, which he has no potency to, which is himself, the divine essence. The only thing he could know would be the divine essence. So the only intelligible species this takes in thomas's epistemology this notion of intelligible species when we when we talk about intelligible species just think of conceptual content okay so like right. the conceptual content by means of which i think about the tree that's the intelligible species so the only intelligible species that god understands is the divine essence and um god understands you know his divine essence perfectly and it's so in understanding it perfectly he understands his his power perfectly and so in understanding his power, he understands everything that is open to his power. So that's how sort of God's knowledge works. Then there's the, 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 the issue of, you know, contingent creation. Okay, so how does God have knowledge of contingent things? God has knowledge of contingent things um, because in knowing the divine essence, he knows the things um, that follow uh, from his power. Pretty much it. So it's, he has necessary knowledge of things which are contingent. In other words, the, the intelligible species by which he knows the contingent thing is not the species of the contingent thing itself. So the trees at the front of my house, God doesn't have knowledge of those in virtue of having the intelligible species of those, you know, trees, Leilandi trees at the front of my house, you know, which have been there for so many years. He has knowledge of those by an intelligible species, which is not that contingent intelligible species, the intelligible species, which is the divine essence, which is the... Uh, you know, which is necessary, okay, which is non-contingent. Uh, right. So that, that's that's the first issue of how, you know, he has knowledge of uh, contingent things. It's by means of, you know, 
the the non contingent divine essence. Now that does bring the issue, bring up the issue then of just what accounts for the contingency of contingent things. And this is God's will. And this is where some of the exciting and awesome stuff comes off. And you know, it gets us into Donald Davidson and Elizabeth Anscombe and intentional action and all that, because the contingency of contingent things is that things don't exist necessarily. Okay, God didn't need to create things. Um, part of God's simplicity is that in him, there isn't a distinction between the individual and the nature. The, the, there's, no, there's no distinction between the individual and the divine nature. Okay, so there's no divine nature to which God is subject and by which God is constrained. Given the you know divine simplicity, God is identical to the divine nature itself. So the divine nature doesn't constrain him in the way that, say, human nature constrains us because we're individuals of human nature. So God isn't an instance of deitas. God just is deitas. <clears throat> now, what that means then is that, you know, let's say, you know, we, we've already got the argumentation for God's being pure goodness in place. It means that God's supreme goodness does not force him to create in the way the Platonists thought. Uh, and how does Thomas, you know, square that? Because the Platonists held and Avicenna held that um, insofar as uh, God is uh, utterly good, he would seek to diffuse his goodness to others. So the good is self-diffusive. Thomas, um, he argues uh, that that principle that the good is self-diffusive um, isn't to be understood in the in the manner of an efficient cause or in the manner of efficient causality, such that the self-diffusiveness of the good means that anything which is good is forced to share its goodness with others. Rather, it's to be understood in terms of a final cause that should um, a, an agent which is good undertake any action, its action will be undertaken in pursuit of the good. So in God himself then, um, as under this understanding his divine essence and understanding it as pure goodness, um, should God undertake any action, he undertakes it out of a, you know, looking to the goodness um, that he, he is as a divine essence. And he can enjoy his divine essence as goodness in eternity without any creatures. So he doesn't need creatures in order to enjoy his goodness, in order to love himself as, you know, um, the divine essence that he is. That then means then that if there are any creatures are brought about by God, not because he has to create them, okay, so not because he needs to create them in order to enjoy his divine goodness, but because he wants to create them in order that they may enjoy his divine goodness. So they are non-necessary means uh, by which God wills his divine goodness, i.e. he wills, you know, these creatures to enjoy his essence. Now then, here is where the really fun stuff begins, and this is where I think, you know, a lot of good work uh, needs to be done. Um, whether that's done by me or somebody else is a different question, but um, how do we understand willing? How do we understand the act of will? Uh, and this is where agent causation comes in. This is where agency comes in because there is an account of agency, right? And it's a very popular account of agency. And it's one that you find in Donald, da Donald Davidson by an intentional action, okay? An action undertaken by an agent, is some species of event, okay? So an intentional action is some sort of an event with the added ingredient of the intention. So we have, ju we have just the physical event in the world, and then we just put in the intention, which is prior to that. So so long as the intention is prior to that, the event which occurs in the world is an intentional action, and the intention is some sort of mental event. So this mental event causes the, the action, and so it's an intentional action. And that's the Davidsonian account. And then he has all sorts of clarifications as to, um, you know, what how we characterize intentional action, you know, the kind of descriptions that, you know, we describe the, the, the action under. Now, that's contrasted, totally and utterly contrasted from that of Elizabeth Anscombe. Anscombe takes herself to be following Aquinas in this. Anscombe argues, and she's very Wittgensteinian here, but it fits in with Aquinas as well. Anscombe argues that there is nothing, there is nothing at all about an action which makes it intentional, other than it's simply being intentional. There's nothing additional to an action conceived of as an event that makes it intentional in the way that, you know, Davidson thinks there's some sort of mental event which causes um, this action. Alaranskim argues that intentional action, the action of an agent is sui generis, and so what we need to do is we need to plot the phenomenology um, of the action. So an intentional action is simply an action that an agent performs. Its intentionality is in the actual performance of the action. 
And she gives the classic example, you know, of an agent, you know, moving its ar- mo- moving his arm to, you know, pump the water to fill the house to poison the inhabitants. Um, the intentionality of that action is not anything in the mind of an agent. She's Wittgensteinian here. There is no sort of mind or private mental space with an intention in it causing things. Rather, the agent just causes um, the event as a basic action. What that then means is that in explaining an, inten- an intentional action and explaining the intentions of an agent, don't go back to some sort of mental content in the agent. We look at what's occurring in the action itself. And now remember, the action of an agent for Aquinas terminates in the patient, in the effect. The action of any, that, that any agent undertakes is not something in the agent, Davidson would hold. It's actually something which is in the effect, as Anscombe holds. So when we want to see the intentionality of some sort of action that an agent undertakes, we look to the effect. We don't look to any sort of event in the mind of the agent. All this is to say, then, is that when God wills something to be, it's not like there's some sort of an event that occurs prior to the coming to be of the thing. The way Davidson were told that there's some sort of mental event which, suitably construed, causes the action. Rather, the intentionality of the agent, the, the will of the agent, is found in the effect, not in the cause. So, can have some sort as, as agents, we can have some sort of reason for acting. And this reason can be sufficiently general that it's multiply analyzable. And when we do act, it can take on a certain form. But the form that it takes on is not in us. It's in the effect, i.e. our action. So similarly, God can have some sort of reason for action suitably general or universal enough that it's multiply analyzable. And when he acts, that action is realized in the patient, i.e. in the creature. And the form that that action takes, the intentionality of that action, is the form or the essence of the creature. But it's not something in the divine essence. So the divine essence remains the same regardless of which creation comes about or even if there's no creation coming about because the willing is not something, uh, some sort of an event in the agent. It's something uh, which occurs in the patient. So... Um, all that is to say that um, the way to understand God's um, sort of willing of something is to adopt a, an Anscomian approach to uh, intentional agency. I'm sorry, there was a lot in that. Um, there was a lot of twists and turns in that. But no, that's a lot. Let's have a handle that. Thanks for that. A lot, a lot of substance there. Um, and if we were to kind of unpack that, it might take a lot of time. But uh, just maybe to bring up a particular example um, mm. to get at what. Uh, I forget who the questioner was. Kayak, I think, had in mind was that okay. Mm. Suppose we we must suppose that God knows that there is a tree in 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 your yard, um, mm. and the fact that there is a tree in your yard is some sort of a contingent fact. But if God's knowledge is sort of um, identical to Him in some way, and God is necessary, mm. isn't how can that knowledge not be necessary? So maybe to kind of understand that the, the concern that someone might have and maybe speak to that a little bit so god's knowledge isn't of you know facts or states of affairs god's knowledge is of things okay so uh generally you know when we talk about knowledge you know we think of some sort of propositional content um that's not what's got with with god's knowledge is like god's knowledge is of things um so it's much more like you you know that uh, have you ever come across this notion of tacit knowledge um so tacit knowledge is yeah, so so tacit knowledge is kind of you know when you're engaged in the flow of the thing. It's not exactly um, uh, knowledge which is you know unthinking or um, unconscious knowledge. It, it does involve thought and it involves rational thought, but it's not to the fore. So if you get up and you open the door and all the rest, you're doing that knowingly, such that if somebody stopped you and asked you what what are you doing, you would say you know what you're doing, but you don't do it in, in a propositional sort of fashion. It's not you know sat down and reflected upon. So God's knowledge isn't propositional in the way that, you know, sort of, you know, the, the Cartesian example of, you know, sitting and thinking things through in a really deep way. It's more like tacit knowledge insofar as you have an awareness um, of things or of objects in reality. And how does God um, have an awareness or a knowledge of that? It's by un- it, it's the, the intelligible species by which God has knowledge of that is the divine essence, not any sort of a intelligible species um in the world in the thing the intelligible species say in the tree in my yard is just you know it's treeness that's all how does god understand treeness by means of the divine essence we can take an example 
Um, let's say, uh, well, here's a good one, uh, Pythagoras' theorem. So um, Pythagoras' theorem, you know, when we're young and we're, when we're in school and we're starting out in a wonderful world of mathematics, we learn Pythagoras' theorem in a very simple sort of way. You know, let's say, let's say, you know, by drawing the square and, you know, by, you know, trying to get double the square and you end up with the four squares and then you half the four squares and then you see the square on the hypotenuse is equal to double the square uh, uh, on the other side. Um, and so that's one way in which we come to know Pythagoras' theorem. That's a very simple sort of way. But then there's a much more profound way that we can come to know Pythagoras' theorem when we say, you know, we get to the end of book one of Euclid. And then there's an even more profounder way when we get the algebra. Okay, so we're understanding the same thing, but each time with a more and more sort of prof profounder um, intelligibility by which to understand it. So the, let's let's say that you know the algebraic way of understanding Euclid's uh, of understanding Pythagoras' theorem is more profound than sort of drawing the squares on the page, and even more profound than Euclid. By means of this, you know, much more profound um, sort of proof in algebra, we can understand the others as well. In other words, we can understand what's less intelligible by means of something which is more intelligible. The divine essence then is supremely intelligible. Okay, so it's pure intelligibility in itself because anything which is intelligible comes from it. And so by means of it, then that which is lesser intelligible, such as, you know, the form of the tree or the form of the human or whatever is, is understood. Now that doesn't make, um, that doesn't render the tree or the human non-contingent precisely because the tree and the human are a result of some sort of created act, creative act, which God had no had no need to bring about and yet does thing bring about. So they're not um, produced necessarily, but they're known by means of the divine essence, which is um, necessary. So to be clear then, maybe unless I'm misunderstanding, it, it's false to say that God knows in the propositional sense, or I guess in any sense that there is in fact a tree in your front yard. That's not something, that's not something that God knows. Yeah. So knowledge by facts, um, knowledge, knowledge um, propositionally is is not something God knows precisely because to know propositionally is to know in a composite sort of way and thus in a creaturely imperfect kind of way. God knows in a much more intimate way than that, more like, you know, our tacit knowledge by means of which kind of we just are able to work in the flow. Like um, another example is a piano player playing the piano and if the piano player kind of has to think about it and focus on it, that, you know, he or she messes up. But if the piano player, you know, that, and that's a supremely rational activity to play the piano. Um, if the piano player just goes with the flow, they're able to do it. God, God's knowledge is much more like that rather than that sort of, you know, separated propositional knowledge. Yeah. Do you think that foregoing this sort of uh, knowledge is, is a, like a cost theologically or is that not really a concern? Um, I'm not really sure I understand. Could you maybe clarify the question? Yeah, sorry. Um, I think that a lot of, of theists and, and Christians in particular, maybe not Thomas, but Christians will uh, want to attribute to God this sort of propositional knowledge. And do you think that denying that he has that sort of knowledge is, is, is much of a cost? Um, um, maybe just it would have some sort of rhetorical cost, you know, if you, if you're in a discussion with somebody and you say this, it's it's like you know the you know the way um, you know Thomas will say you know that God doesn't have a real relation to creatures. Um, people will sort of be jarred at that and they'll think what? And so it, it could have a rhetorical cost, but you know systematically speaking, you know that doesn't really matter systematically o unless you know one's engaged with a philosopher who's not really you know. Um, doing philosophy, but is trying to, you know, score rhetorical points. But I mean, we're assuming that everybody in this sort of philosophical theological discussion is being honest and acting with integrity. So, um, you know, so long as it's explained out and, you know, and explained properly that propositional knowledge is actually a weaker form of knowledge and reflects, you know, sort of creaturely limitation and contingency. Um, I don't really see a problem with it. Um, in general, I don't really see a problem with, you know, philosophical theological positions, which are kind of well established, you know, and part of a whole sort of, you know, system of things, even if even if it does sound odd or jarring to begin with. Fair enough. So I think we'll move on to a question from Hound of Heaven, if you want to uh, ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I've been reading about Blessed John Don Scotus' sense about Christmas this year, and, or last <laughs> year, and um, I've 
I can't, <laughs> I, I think the formal distinction is true. So I'm going to lay out a brief argument for it and uh, see what mm. you think. So mm. the um, Thomist virtual distinction, the major virtual distinction, the one that's said to have a foundation in a thing, I generally take that to mean like a truth maker in the thing. Um, so I can't figure out what this means if you're denying the formal distinction. Because if you're saying the different foundations of the truth makers are distinct in act, that seems like you've just admitted the formal distinction. But if you say they're only in, uh, they're only distinct in potency to the action of the mind, then it seems like what the mind is thinking about are, like what the mind has knowledge of are the concepts and not the thing itself. And you would give up uh, immediate realism about knowledge, which Aquinas uh, rejects in the Summa. I could give you the citation for that if you wanted it. Um, and I can't figure out if there's like a third option or if I've just misconstrued something here along the way. Does, does so, um, so, um, the, the virtual distinction, what do you mean by that? The, uh, the major virtual distinction, the one that's taken to be only distinct posterior to the action of the mind, but has a foundation in the thing. So it's not like a distinct qua object. It would be like between animality and rationality or the will and the intellect. Right, right. Okay. Um, I've, I've never had, heard that put forth um, as a virtual distinction. I've always, you know, heard that put forth as a logical distinction. Who uses the terminology of virtual distinction? Um, I believe, uh, oh, maybe I've messed this up. I, everyone that I can remember reading has said this is, uh, like, has talked about this as a virtual distinction. Um, but wait, wait, wait. What, what, what do you mean by what do you mean by virtual distinction then? It, like different different to this. Usually, when I hear virtual distinction, it, it's it's not something that I've heard an awful lot of or read an awful lot of in Thomas. Maybe maybe I'm just missing something. Oh. But um, um, usually, you know, when you see you know something you know virtual in virtute, it means in power or in the power of the thing. Um. There's virtual here sounds like you know a, a, a distinction of reason or a, or a, or some sort of logical distinction. I, I might have uh, mistaken the two different um, terms in that case, but either way, e e if it is a distinction of reason, uh, well, actually, I think it. Is, I think it is. I've always thought that virtual distinctions were a kind of distinction of reason, but that, that again, that could that's probably just a deficiency in me. Um, yeah. Now, so go over the issue then with um, the objective formal distinction in SCOTUS. Okay, yeah. So for SCOTUS, uh, the two different formalities, I'll just take the will and the intellect as an example, are uh, really distinct in the thing. Now, to say really distinct, I just mean distinct in act. I don't mean they're distinct substances. I don't mean they're parts. I just mean they're distinct in act. Uh, for Thomas, as far as I can tell, uh, they aren't distinct in act. In the thing, they're really identical. And it's only posterior to the action of the mind uh, viewing the thing that they become distinct. Uh, now, right. if you, right. yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, with that particular example, intellect and will, um, I mean, could turn uh, turn on how specific you get into the readings of uh, Thomas and Scotus in this issue. I mean, for Thomas, the the intellect and the will, um, they're distinct insofar as we have the intellect, which understands, you know kind of the form of the thing, the intelligibility of the thing. And then the will is the intellect's understanding of the thing in uh, virtue of it, it's being perceived as good. So you understand water is H2O, but then after, you know, uh, after a session at the gym and you're thirsty, you see the water, you know it's H2O, but you, you perceive it as a good. And so you pursue it. And so the, the will is uh, the intellectual appetite for the good. So there is a distinction there, and um, there are distinct formalities in which you know, um, intellect and will um, are understood, but it's um, it's one and the same faculty of the rational soul which is being understood. The contrast with Scotus then, so far as I understand, is that Scotus almost seems to go as far as saying that the intellect and will are distinct faculties in the soul. Uh, would that maybe, be correct? Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I'm not certain, but maybe we can take an example which would avoid this then. And just uh, move out a little bit to say uh, animality and rationality because those right. aren't going to be identical. Um, uh -huh. so they won't so, be the same faculty. 
So animality and rationality, the reason why they're not identical is because um, rationality is just some specification of animality. It's a way of being an animal. So again, just as the will is the way of the intellect, you know, is the way that the intellect is sort of enacted in sort of perceiving, understanding something as good. So rationality is a way of, um, of, of expressing animality, a way of expressing animality distinct from a different way of um, expressing animality. So there is, you know, a kind of an analogical reasoning there um, that just, just mm -hmm. as the will is, is a certain way in which the intellect no, sort of is realized so too rationality is a certain way that animality is realized but there's um, still a there's still like distinct intelligible contents to being an animal and then being rational specifically because otherwise you wouldn't be able to uh see the commonality between like a kangaroo and a human you would just sure. say like like th so there has to be some sort of distinct thing in the creature well maybe thing is the wrong word but formality in the creature uh, prior to the action of the mind, which is the truth maker for this is an animal, this is rational. Like there are. Um, well, I wouldn't want to push that too far. I mean, all I would want to say is that rationality is just the way animality is expressed in certain things. I mean, that, that, that's as far as I would want to go with that. And then, you know, let's say, you know, you take, take K, a dog, canine entity. Is just the way that animality is expressed in those things. Um, I guess I wouldn't I, really. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't I really. Sorry, well, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of wouldn't really. I, I wouldn't really want to go much further than that and say that there. Yeah, you, there, there's distinct intelligible content there for sure because you know we have a distinct, you know, formed individual there before us. Um, you know that that, that we can understand, uh, and then we you know we can classify that and break that down. Um, but I I wouldn't really want to say that there. You know, there's these distinct things in the animal by which it is rational and by which it is animal. Well, they wouldn't be like distinct substances, um, but oh. it seems like I don't know. It does. It's it just. I, I guess I just don't understand what it means to say that like uh, the same thing is the truth maker for the difference and the agreement between a kangaroo and a uh, human. Like if, if if they're not distinct after if they're, if they're not distinct before the action of the mind, it just looks like the kangaroo has it like the same thing serves as the truth maker for similarity and dissimilarity. And I maybe the pro uh, yeah maybe the problem is you know thinking of the, this in terms of truth makers. I mean that 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 suggests the correspondence theory, which I mean Thomas is going to reject. Could you could you not get this in uh, on supervenience on the uh, what do you call it uh, truth supervenes on being being yeah but it, even then that, that that suggests that you know truth is you know something distinct from being which supervenes over it which again suggests correspondence sort of view I uh, well I guess I, I guess I just don't know what it would mean to throw that out uh, mm. and, uh, I, I suppose. And if we think of our knowledge of being simply as, you know, being presented with some sort of um, individual substance, which brings in the operation, of perceptual capacities and our conceptual capacities, and we, sort of, we, we grasp certain things about um, the substance before us, that needn't be a correspondence, you know, theory, you know, where we've got, you know, say, propositional content and truth makers. I could just say that so you not... knowledge in this account is, you know, forming our thought. Sorry, go on. Oh, sorry, I uh... go on. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I, I guess I just don't understand. Is there anything that I could read about uh, truth makers and theory of truth uh, for this? Then I would really advise against reading about truth makers and theory of <laughs> truth. I'm not a fan of it. Um, um, actually, something good to read on this. Um, have you heard of Joseph Owens? Uh, I've heard the name before, but I've never read him. Yeah, he wrote a great book, um, The Doctrine of Being and the Aristotelian Metaphysics. And at the end, um, he 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 did a lot of his work. It wasn't on Aquinas originally; it was on Scotus. 
And at the at the end of that book, th this book was used as a textbook for years on Aristotle's metaphysics. At the end of it, he has a discussion of Scotus's objective formal distinction. And as memory serves me, um, he brings it very close to Aquinas, um, uh, Aquinas's views on uh, you know distinct metaphysical components in the thing, not 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 the real distinction between essence and existence, obviously, but. Mm -hmm. But you know, distinction between matter and form, essence and quiditas and hiketas. And he 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 brings Scotus, you know, a lot closer to Aquinas than you know others would be would be happy to admit. I remember reading it and I was, you know, pretty impressed by it. I've always been sympathetic to, to Scotus anyway in the objective formal distinction. I haven't really seen it be much of a threat to Thomism. Um mm -hmm. I mean, that, that might be something yeah. worthwhile engaging with. But with the truth maker business, um, I mean, try, trying to think of the best way to sort of bring it all together. Yeah, if you're thinking of truth makers, then, you know, distinct, you know, um, truths about the being of the thing, going to have to have some sort of, you know, really distinct truth makers. So um, the really distinct truth makers is going to have to be, you know, principle by which, you know, the thing is a, an animal, the principle by which is, is a distinct animal, i.e. the differentiating principle. And they're going to have to, there's mm -hmm. going to have to be some real distinction in them in order for those to uh, function as, you know, the truth truth maker for a proposition about a rational animal. So I can see where that's yeah. coming from. But if we reject that sort of, you know, whole truth maker outlook, we can just say that it's it's the individual substance, you know, before us, uh, which grants the truth of any of our thought about the substance. And our thought about a substance then is just a manifold of, you know, conceptual content. Um, which latches on to various different uh, conceptual features um, of the substance. Okay. So that, okay. but that would be, I mean, Lonergan, that, that, that would follow closely Lonergan's sort of view when it comes to knowing, and that would be very close to that sort of German idealist um, point. I don't, I, I don't know if you would be happy, you know, sort of cozying up to, you know, <laughs> kind of German idealism thought through in a realist way. Uh, actually, that's what most of your work has been on, hasn't it? In the past, at least, on like uh, germ on idealism and Thomism. Yeah, With yeah. My Kant. my my doctorate was on Kant, and then you know I moved on to Sellers and McDowell and that whole school. So yeah, I mean, it's always been. I only accidentally got into God and philosophy of religion. Um, Whoopsie. <laughs> okay. So, well. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't have a better answer um, for that question. I think maybe the, the the difference lies at a deeper sort of level on how we read Thomas on knowledge and knowing and truth, uh, and how we mm -hmm. understand Scotus on the objective formal distinction. Yeah, there's one other thing that I think is playing a part in it. Uh, I'm reading a book called The Singular Voice of Being by a guy named Andrew Lazella. I think it's really good. Okay. But uh, okay. he yeah. talks about how for Thomas, distinction and uh, the distinction is partially a result of composition of, uh, what do you call it, uh, being and relative non-being. Um, right, yeah. And I think he got that from uh, his commentary on the on Boethius's De Trinitate. Uh, mm. Mm. I, I, I think that might be, <laughs> I think that might be at the root of the difference, but I'm right. not certain because, you know, I'm like uh, barely literate. I'm going to be quiet now. Uh, thank you for your answer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the question and the book recommendation. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Um, you mentioned there that uh, you've done some work in the past on, on idealism and mm. idealistic metaphysics. What, what do you think? Do you think any of those approaches are, 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 are views are plausible or worth taking seriously? Or can you maybe yeah. comment on that briefly? I can't. Um, so... Idealism, to me, it, it's genus faced. Um, so, I mean, hopefully, most of your listeners, you know, by, by the sounds of the sorts of questions I'm getting here, most of your listeners will know who Plato is and um, will have heard of Plato before. Um, I, I think of idealism, German idealism in particular, the way I think about Plato as a Thomist, the way I think about Plato, there's so much which is good and I would say true in uh, Platonism, but then so much which is just bad in it and uh, and that's you know the separate existence of the forms he almost he's so close and then kind of he falls away and i that's the way i feel about uh, german idealism particularly in kant i think the the greatest insight that kant had which you know really saves modernity um and it was the high point of modern philosophy and it you know brought some sanity back into modern philosophy was recognition that 
experience, perceptual experience, as John McDowell puts it, the perceptual experience does not add any notionally distinct item to knowledge. There is no content of experience, which is just the content of experience. So it's not the case that we have an experience and then the intellect goes to work on the experience to try to make it intelligible. Rather, the content of experience is the content of thought. And so in order to be the content of thought, there has to be something about the content of experience which is thinkable. I think that was genius. Well, I mean, genius because Kant was working within the context of modernity where that whole notion was just rejected completely. Um, you know, the content of experience in moder modernity was, was unintelligible. In Descartes, you got the distinction between the res cogitans and the res extensa. And the res extensa is nothing but quantifiable. It doesn't have conceptual content to it. Concepts occur in the head in the res cogitans uh, for Descartes. You know, you've got human uh, empiricism, where you've got, you know, sort of atomic reality bouncing off us, um, bringing about simple ideas and then more complex ideas by, you know, principles of association. Kant kind of sees through all that and he realizes the way in which we can have knowledge is through conformity. There has to be conformability between mind and world. The two have to become unified with each other and the way they're unified with each other is through conceptual content. Now, that that's the genius move. <laughs> the problem there then is precisely how Kant applies that. Because the conformability between mind and world for Kant it's that the world has to come into conformity with mind. Why does the world have to come into conformity with mind for Kant? Because Kant wants to preserve the modern notion of the spontaneity of the mental, of the spontaneity of understanding. He wants to leave understanding spontaneous. And that's, you know, a hangover from, you know, his rationalism, that he wants to preserve that spontaneity, that creativity of the mental. Um, and so given that creativity, that freedom of mentality, that freedom to be wrong, it's the content. It, it, it's 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 the content of experience which um, you know mediates the world, which is formed um, by you know the a priori forms and the categories. You know, all is subject to the transcendental ego. And I think that's a big problem. Um, you know, this sort of carryover of the spontaneity of the mental. Um, I think you know if Kant, well, it would have been great if Kant, you know, had have you know read the medievals and you know the sort of medieval Aristotelians on this that you know. Reality can be formed in, in a certain way, and that mentality is just a, something that a physical substance does. It's a capacity that is, you know, a capacity that it has in virtue of the sort of substance that it is, so that the world can be mediated uh, by the conceptual content, which is already there in the world uh, to be discovered. So when it comes to idealism, I think, you know, um, I think it's brilliant, genius, and um, high point of modern philosophy, but also, you know, kind of a big letdown because it, it ends up, you know, me, meaning that the world is subject to mentality rather than mentality to the world. So that, that, that's what I, that's what I think about idealism. No, that's, that? that's a good answer. Um, all right, I think we'll move on. Actually, before I move on to a couple more questions, um, we've been going for I think almost an hour and a half. Are you? How much longer are you willing to uh, take some more questions? Yeah, so um, let's say, you know, about another half an hour. We'll get to about 10 o'clock over here at my end. How's that sound? Sounds perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, for two taking hours, time. yeah. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah. So yeah, on the earlier discussion about God's knowledge, Hassan had a sort of follow-up um, mm. of sort of clarification. Are, are you denying that God knows particulars? Um, not in the slightest. Nope, definitely not. Okay. Um, but I, I, I was taking, I was, as I understood it, that yeah, I thought you were saying that God doesn't know in a sort of propositional sense that certain mm -hmm. contingent facts. Um, but if we're taking those things to be, for example, that we're having a conversation now is presumably some sort of contingent fact. Um, mm -hmm. That. Does God know that we're having this conversation now? That's the sort of particulars I think Hassan has in mind. Yeah, but he doesn't know it as a in, in a propositional way. God knows individual contingent things. He doesn't know them by means of intelligible species proper to those um, individual contingent things. God knows me as the individual contingent thing I am, um, precisely because I exist and would not exist. We're not God causing me right here, right now. 
and knowing me as the individual con contingent thing I am, he knows um, the various um, relations in, in which I'm engaged, but he doesn't know that in a propositional sense. So he doesn't know um, in the sense of, you know, I know that Gavin is doing this, that, and the other. He knows his divine essence. And in knowing his divine essence, he knows me, everything that I'm doing right now, and all the relations I'm engaged in right now as an imitation of that divine essence. Right. But how, maybe this is not something that we can really answer, but how, hmm? how, it's one thing to say that, you know, the, the essences of things are in some sense in the divine essence. Um, but it's another to say, and so, so we can, God could understand your essence in that way. But it's <laughs> sort of another thing to say that God knows how these things are related or certain contingent states of the world involving these things. You see that there's a sort of step there or, or am I misunderstanding something? The way in which God knows the essence of anything is because he knows his power. He knows that everything, everything that is open to his power and he knows exactly what is subject right but to his but, power whenever it is subject to his power and so my yeah. hmm? sorry oh, yeah my, so one thing that's open to god's power i take it is um creating the sort of world that we inhabit um but that's the fact that it's open to his power doesn't mean that he will in fact create it in that way um there's presumably other things open to his power uh, so so remember the discussion earlier when we talked about God's will, that things exist because of God's will, because, you know, God acts to bring them about. And then all the clarifications, you know, right. made on that with regard to intentional action. So assuming all those clarifications in place, anything that God has brought about, um, God knows it to be here and now subject to his power. So the actual things that exist, he knows to be subject to his power. So it's not just the possibilities subject to his power. It's also the actualities which are in fact subject to his power that he knows. Right. I think I kind of understand, but uh, uh, instead of following up on that, maybe we'll just uh, I'll just move on to uh, some of the other questions we had. Um, uh, if you're happy to do that, yeah, um, we can follow up if you like, or if you want to move on to other questions, that's fine as well. I'm I'm happy. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Uh, maybe we'll come back to that if, if I think or someone else thinks of a, a sort of follow-up on that. But um, hey, Khan was actually wondering what your view is on the Eucharist. In particular, is there transubstantiation, mm. consubstantiation, or, or something else? Or... Yeah, um, so uh, Eucharistic theology, I'm just going to have to hold my hands up and say it's not something that I've really engaged with at all, at all. Um, so I'm really sorry, Hakon. Um, I've, I've not engaged with it, um, and that's 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 my to my shame. I haven't engaged with it. Of you know, I've got into Trinity and Christology sacraments has have been uh, has been something I've been you know been interested in engaging in, but I just haven't as yet. Not, not being a professional theologian, it's not it just hasn't been a pressing issue for me. So um, I'm really sorry. I can't answer that one, Hakon. I, w I wouldn't be able to answer it in any sort of intelligent fashion. That would be satisfying. I'm sorry about that. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, so actually, Dog was wondering some other uh, mm -hmm. some, some things about God's mentality. I guess one thing to ask is, does God have uh, like qualitative states or phenomenal states in the way that, analogous to the way that we do or, or not? So um, it depends on what you mean by qualitative or, or phenomenal states. Um, could, could you clarify that? Well, well, the, it's, there's something it's like to be God is maybe one way to put it, or maybe he has like some sort of experiences of right, like right, we do in, okay. in the sense if we have visual or sensory experiences. Or... Yeah. So, I mean, is there something that it's like to be God? I mean, generally that question, you know, asking you know, what, it, what it's like to be in a certain state, that applies to things which are individuals of a kind. Uh, and so as an individual of a kind, you know, we can ask what it's like to be a human as opposed to what it's like to be a dog or whatever. Given that God isn't an individual of a kind, the um, sort of the question, you know, what it is like to be God um, is in a sense inapplicable because there's nothing that it's like to be God except by being God. So there's no sort of, you know, sort of common qualitative state that we could point to that it would be like 
um, to be God other than simply being God. Um, so that, that would be one way to go with that. The other one, whether or not, you know, sort of God has qualia. Qualia are sort of um, uh, representational content um, uh, that, that something has. So um, I have qualia, if there is qualia, so believers in qualia um, hold that it, it's some sort of representational content, usually um, a perceptional content, content color properties or um, the, the, the typical examples that, that one has through one's engagement with the world. So the really famous thought experiment, you know, of, you know, uh, Mary, who knows everything there is to know about neuroscience, but has been stuck in a black and white room all her life. And then um, as soon as, I think her name was Mary, and as, as, as soon as Mary, you know, mm -hmm. leaves this room when you, when you, when he is older um, and sees red for the first time, there's a definite new experience that she has. Um, that God doesn't have any sort of uh, perceptual uh, capabilities um, because he doesn't have a body. Um, he doesn't have qualia in that sense. Um, when we talk about God's mental content, what do we mean by that? Well, God's thought. What does God have a thought of? He has a thought of the divine essence. Um, that's all. What is it to, to have a thought? Well, it's simply, you know, to have some sort of, you know, um, the, the form of something in one's intellect. For us, that's the forms of distinct things. For God, that's simply the divine essence itself. Fair enough. Um, so it, so it would all you... depend on, sorry, it, just, just to follow, it would all depend on, you know, the concept of mentality um, that one right. has, generally generally on a post-Cartesian account of mentality. Um, to, to be a subject of mentality means to just have this private inner space into which thought enters. Um, but you know, there's one would need to see some sort of justification for that sort of account of mentality. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I think a concern that a lot of people might have is that when we think about mentality or we sort of define what we mean by mentality, we kind of have to use ourselves as sort of a starting point, the sort of experiences and so forth that we have. And if that's the case, then when we, and, and we're not really able to attribute to God the sort of mental features th that we have, um, it seems that we kind of have to conclude that God doesn't really have mentality so conceived, or, or maybe that's the wrong way to conceive of mentality, or maybe there is some way to show that there's some common feature, but you well, kind of understand actually, what the concern is. I would actually go in a different um, way. I, I, I would follow, you know, Wittgenstein here that, you know, even when it comes to, you know, our experience of our own mentality, we can sort of, you know, go down one route and think of mentality in a very sort of Cartesian way. But Wittgenstein has a lot of these, you know, different sort of thought experiments and, you know, way of putting things across to say, well, look, we can think about our own mentality, yes, in that Cartesian way, but also uh, in another way, if we kind of just reframe how we think about it. So, even then, we can, you know, sort of, you know, change, you know, our our, our stance on our experience of mentality, so that it's a it's a non Cartesian kind of, you know, outlook. Right. Um. So actually, we had a follow up on the on the knowledge thing from Hassan. Uh, yeah, and I'll just yeah. read out their question. He <laughs> says, "I guess my question is that since God knows all essences by knowing His power." And because these essences are only instantiated insofar as God wills those particular instances to participate in his power in that way and to that extent, how is God's will for particulars to exist in those instances extrinsic to him? Because hmm. he wills some metaphysically possible things to be and not others. Hmm. Yeah, very good. So that kind of follows up in this whole issue of mentality. So if we have a, a post-Cartesian view of mentality, when I will something, the act of will occurs in my mind, and then that causes me to act. And this is the sort of Davidsonian approach. So I'm not saying that David, Davidson is a Cartesian, but I would say that there is a, a, a Cartesian type of mentality going on there in Davidson. So for Davidson, some sort of intentional action is something which is preceded by a mental event, and then that mental event causes um, the physical event, which is the action, which is suitably intentional because it comes from some sort of intention as a mental event. Now, contrast that. So I'll not even bring up uh, Anscombe this time, but I'll bring up uh, Wittgenstein. In the philosophical investigations, towards the end of the philosophical investigations, around about paragraph 620 or thereabouts, 
Wittgenstein says, look, what's the difference between me raising my hand and my hand just being raised? Okay, there is no difference between my raising my hand and my hands being raised. When I will to raise my hand, there's nothing going on in my intellect. I just, I simply raise my hand because I'm an agent and that's something that I can do. There isn't any sort of, you know, prior sort of, you know, will to raise my hand. I just do it. Think about all the times that, you know, you do things without thinking about them, like getting up, walking out of the room. You, you, you do it without thinking, but they're intelligent things that you're doing precisely because um, if you were stopped and asked, what are you doing? You could say, well, this is what I'm doing, as opposed to blinking or aspiring or digesting. If people say to you, what are you doing when you're blinking? You could say, oh, I didn't know I was doing that. Where if people, somebody stops you while you're getting up and walking out of the room and you said, oh, I didn't know I was doing that, you would say, well, of course you did, because you're doing it. You're engaged in an action there. So on this account, actions then don't arise out of some preconceived, you know, some sort of intention in the mind of an agent. An action is just something an agent does for a certain reason. And the form or the intentionality of that action is something realized in the act itself. OK, so the action of an agent terminates in the patient in, in, in the case of some sort of basic action, like the movement of my hand, the termination of that action is the actual movement itself. Okay, So the action is just the movement of my hand itself. So that when God wills something to exist, it's not the case that there's some sort of thing called, you know, the will for this or the will for that in the mind of God. God wills something to exist. It's like the basic action that an agent engages in. The reality of that is something in the patient. And that's what we say that the will is. God's will for a particular is the actuality um, of the patient, of the creature itself. Now, God, you, you know, there's some sort of reason by which God has to create and in the same way that there's some sort of reason um, that we have for acting. And that reason can be sufficiently general that it's multiply realizable. So God's reason can be sufficiently general that it's multiply realizable. And then these different realizations occurs when God wills them. So it's not the case that there's some sort of will um, within, you know, the mind of God as agent, because that's not how intentional action works on this account. Um, to think that it does would be to, you know, adopt a more Davidsonian sort of a count of uh, the will and mental events than one that I would argue is the more Thomistic sort of view. Um, All right. Does that sound? Yeah. So just maybe as a follow-up, how do we distinguish like intentional action from unintentional or, or merely behavioral uh, facts? <laughs> So all intentional action is the action of an agent, and it answers to a particular sort of why question. Um, so any intentional action is an action that um, has an answer to the why question, why are you doing that? So let's say um, somebody who, you know, sort of blinking, um, stroking one's beard, um, that's sort of, you know, all these sort of wee ticks that humans have. Um, if you ask them, why are you doing that? And they respond with, um, well, look, I didn't know I was doing that. Um, yeah, that, that would be a fair, you know, a thoroughly, you know, sort of legitimate response to that, um, because that's not something that you're doing. That's something that's happening to you, but it's not something that you're doing. Whereas when it comes to, you know, getting up and walking across the room to go to the kitchen, you know, or whatever, um, you do it without you do it without thinking. But it's still something that it's an action that you're undertaking such that if somebody did stop you to uh, and, and asked you, what are you doing? You could say if, if you were to say, I didn't know I was doing that. He would say, catch yourself on. Of course, you knew you were doing it. You, you know, you plotted a trajectory across the room and, um, you know, you opened the door. Um, so the uh, the actions of an agent, intentional actions, they're answerable to a, a kind of why question, whereas mere happenings aren't answerable to a why question. All right. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, so we'll move on to a question from David Lee Roth, if he wants to get in VC and ask his question. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Kerr, uh, for coming. Uh, thank you for taking all the questions. I have a couple, and uh, let me start with uh, a couple of things. Uh, I wanted to, first of all, address divine simplicity, and I'm sure you get asked about this a lot, so I feel kind of like, you know, awkward piling on, but um, so there's been a particular objection. I believe you briefly touched on it. I apologize if I missed the part where you extremely touched on it, so I guess I would do the question again. Um, which is uh, the basic objection goes that if God is necessary, as all uh, traditional theists agree, and he exists in all possible worlds, uh, and if God isn't composed of parts, or at least uh, is pure essence, 
uh, as I believe Thomists formulated, wouldn't that mean that his desire to create the world exists in all possible worlds, since his desire is not, for example, separate from his essence uh, because of divine simplicity, and thus that would mean he's not actually free to choose uh, to create the world if his desire exists in all possible worlds. So that's, I guess, the first question. Do, do you believe there is a way out of that conundrum? Uh, secondly, uh, what is the Thomistic take on uh, the free will debate? Uh, we hear a lot of people saying that you know, fierce debate about whether uh, to understand Thomism in the context of compatibilism or libertarian free will. Uh, what is your take on that? And I guess a couple of other questions are, um, in the end, what is the, um, what do you maybe mean? Maybe get to these, after. maybe start with the first two. Okay. Okay. Come back. All right, maybe you can just touch on the first two and then we'll see. What so how do we address that first one? Just deny that God exists in all possible worlds. Why, why would you think God exists in all possible worlds? Why, why would you, why would oh, you have sorry. that? I, I guess I couldn't see that. You deny that God is necessary? No, no, I, I grant that God is necessary. I just don't think that necessity is cashed out in terms of possible worlds. Oh, okay. Then maybe you have a different uh, version of necessity. Okay, so uh, let me rephrase the question then. Uh, <clears throat> so you are not a necessitarian, of course. So the question is going to be, if God is necessary and God isn't composed of parts, does that mean his desire to create the world is also necessary? Yeah, so... um. I don't think it's right to say that God has a desire um, to create the world. Um, if we talk about, you know, anything in God with regard to desire, it's the, the desire for the divine essence, which is himself. That's the only desire that he has because, and when we talk about desire, what we're talking about is understanding of the divine essence as good. So in understanding the divine essence, he understands it as good. And so to understand something as, as good is to love it and value it as good. Um, and so that's um, the the only sort of desire or act of will uh, that God has. He doesn't have um, a desire or act of will to uh, create the world per se. So how, so, how does that start as an opening? Yeah, I'm a little confused. I, I mean, I'm just want to make it clear. I'm a Roman Catholic myself. I, and I'm a full-blooded papist, but uh, this this doctrine has been a little bit of a a hurdle, I guess. So I'm not in any way trying to challenge Roman Catholicism. I'm just wondering, uh, you deny that God has a desire to create the world? Uh, uh, yes, I deny that he has a desire in itself to create the world. He does create the world. Sorry, and sorry. He... So, okay, fine. Let's rephrase it. What about um, an intention? W would it be accurate to say that God had an intention to create the world? Again, how, how do you understand intention here? I mean, we've talked quite a bit about an intention. Certainly an intention isn't a mental event. Um, the intentionality of an action is basically what occurs in the act itself. And in the act of creating, that's, you know, the, the creature. So the intentionality of the act of creation is the creature. So again, you know, I would deny that God has any sort of intention in that sort of way in terms of a mental event. Right. Um... So uh, I'm sorry uh, if I'm like still slightly misunderstanding. Um, so from a to Thomistic account, God, of course, has mental states, right? Again, again cash that out. God um, understands what he understands is, is the divine essence. If that's all you mean by a mental state, yes, um, God has a mental state. But I mean, I'd be very careful to distinguish that from, you know, say a Cartesian view of mental states. Oh, so God isn't, for example, a thinking agent uh, on Thomism, as Descartes put it. Like, you don't think that God is a Cartesian thinking? No, no, definitely not. The go God's not a modern th thinker or philosopher, no. So then, if if I may, again, I'm slightly diverting because this is all new to me. I'm I'm just getting into Thomism, okay? So let's, let's, let me try this. Uh, so is God even a mind on that view? Um, again, it depends on what you, you know, you understand by mind. I mean, mind is an invention of Descartes. Um, and you know, mind is this sort of private inner mental space into which, you know, thoughts, ideas, and representations, um, enter. I don't think God is anything like that. God is just God pure existence. Mind. God is not a mind. Yeah, I mean, I don't like talk, talk of mind. I mean, I'm very anti-Cartesian. My way of thinking well, here and you know this is 
<laughs> so I, they, I'm, very, I'm very Cartesian. <laughs> I'm very Cartesian. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of people are. Yeah, I mean, there's this talk of mind is you know second nature to an awful lot of people. I mean, God, God just is pure existence itself, and in virtue of being that, God is intelligent. He understands something, which is the okay, divine right. essence so, itself. Uh, okay, now now I understand. Like I, I think I completely understand. So let's uh, let me rephrase the first question slightly different. I think you would agree that God did create the universe. Was this act? Are you going to, um, I, I think uh, Edward Fazer is famous for uh, saying, well, replying to, um, yeah, Jonathan, I saw that. <laughs> so I think that um, Fazer was the one to say, uh, for example, when such an objection was raised about God's act of creation, Fazer said that the universe coming into existence is a like Cambridge property of God. And that's the, oh, right. yeah. Yeah. so is that a view you defend? I don't, I don't, I don't like talk of Cambridge properties. I, I defend um, a similar view, uh, uh, but just not in terms of Cambridge properties. I think Cambridge properties are problematic um, when brought into this so, discussion. So why don't we rephrase? So why don't we rephrase the first question and put it this way: um, If God, all, if God is necessary and He has no parts, does that mean that God's act of creation is necessary? Let's put it that way. Yeah. So no, God's act of creation isn't necessary. As we were uh, looking at earlier, um, so God creates um, because. He understands, okay, so he, he understands the divine essence itself. He understands it as good, and so he loves the divine essence. Any reason, then, that God has to create is a reason undertaken out of the love that he has for the divine essence, i.e. the good. So, in other words, when God brings something into existence, he does so um, because he wants it to enjoy the good that he himself is. But the things that he brings into existence, they're not necessary for God to enjoy the divine essence. They're an unnecessary means um, for God to will the divine essence, which is that, you know, God brings things into existence to enjoy his divine essence. That's the first bit. Um, do we want to stop with that or do we want to go a wee bit further? So, you know, I sort of give you the, the, the sort of account, the, the non-Cambridge property sort of account on, on how, I you know. I, I think I understand. I, I don't want to take too much time because there's still a couple of questions. So why don't we move to the second one, which is uh, the free will? What's What's your take? So um, I know Matthews Grant. Uh, you know he brought out that that recent book on you know free will and the extrinsic model. Um, I just read it recently. I'm still digesting it. Um, uh, we hold that you know sort of you know um, creature. There there are some creatures which have free will, and they have free will precisely because they can um, engage in some sort of action out of uh, an intrinsic principle. There's some principle intrinsic to them by means of which they can engage in an action. And so I think that suffices um, for an action to be free. Um, so, so long as the action comes from within them, um, their knowledge of the end, let's say, um, they're willing for that end on the basis of that knowledge is free. Is that consistent um, with God's universal and absolute causality? I think it is, precisely because God as a cause um, grants the existence um, to the agent. And in granting the existence to the agent, he co-creates all that is within the agent, uh, both the agent's intellect and will, um, for any time um, and at any point that that agent exists. So whenever I'm undertaking, um, you know, an, an act of free will, let's say, you know, going and making myself a coffee um, after this, I, you know, sort of making my, my, my existence when I'm making myself a coffee and all the different faculties within me at that very moment um, are granted existence by God. So God's granting existence to the intellect, to the will, um, by which I uh, engage in that, um, you know, freely willed action. And so I'm, you know, engaging in an act of free will, which act of free will is being caused um, by God at the same time. So I think there's a consistency there on the two. Thanks so much, Dr. Kerr, uh, for your comprehensive answers. I apologize if I looked a bit stupid. <laughs> Thank you. No, nobody's come across as stupid. A couple of people have said that. No, nobody's come across as stupid. These are all great questions. Thank you for asking them. All right, awesome. So oh, a couple more questions. Uh, mm. J7300 was, was wondering if you have a particular view on sort of the theory of time and, and how God relates to time. Is, is God a temporal being? Does he exist at different times or atemporal or, or something else? 
This brings up a really interesting question. So can it preceded by, you know, the whole issue of relation, you know, God, how God and creatures relate? Because it sort of relates to that issue of Cambridge properties. Um, uh, would that be all right? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, that helps set up. Okay, so um, on the Thomist view, um, you have uh, two different um, relations, which sets up three different, you know, what we could say is relationships. You have um, when when you have things which are related, you know, you have the, the terms of the relations, and each term of the relation bears a relation to the other term. So, if one thing is really related to the to another thing, there is a real foundation in the thing by which it bears that real relation to another. Say, taller than. So, if I am taller, you know, than my son, let's say, there's something real in me by means of which I am taller than him. Um, should I, you know, and, and then there's something real in him uh, by means of which he is shorter than me. Um, should he grow taller? That relation change, and he's no longer shorter than, or that he's no longer as shorter than me. Should you know that relation change? He will change as well for that relation to change. So in real relations, there's something in the things themselves by which they're related to each other. In logical relations, not something in the thing itself by means of which um, the relation occurs. Rather, it's something in how we think about the thing. So the relation is predicated depending on how we think about the thing. And the example that Thomas gives is that of self-identity. A thing is identical to itself, not in the sense that you know, you've got two things, so you don't have two Gavins, and then you say that each of them has the relationship of being identical to the other. It's rather, you know, you take the thing and you think about it as if it were double and affirm that it is identical to itself, but it's not as if there are a real double there. And on the basis of that, there are three, there are three different kinds of you know, relationship. Um, you can have, you know, a relation which is wholly logical. That's, say, the relation of self-identity. You can have um, a relationship in which the, you know, relation that, you know, one thing has the other and vice versa is real. So whereby both of them have something in them by means of which they're really related to each other, taller than and shorter than. But then you can have what's called a mixed relation. A mixed relation is whereby the relation is real at one end, but only logical at the other end. And a classic example of this is a state of knowing. So in a state of knowledge, there is something real, there's some real change that occurs in me whenever I know something. So I know the tree in front of me. The tree is the cause of my knowledge. And so there is something um, real. I, I undergo real sort of change um, whenever I gain knowledge of the tree. So I have that there, there's something about me or in me, my knowledge, by means of which I'm related to the tree. Um, and so I'm changed in virtue of coming into that relation. Whereas the tree only has a logical relation to me. The tree doesn't undergo any change in being known by me. It doesn't matter that it's known by me. It just remains as it is in, by, in, in becoming known by me or not known by me. And that's a, a logical relation that occurs to me. And so that relationship is a mixed relation, real on one end, logical on the other. And that was, uh, and, and that's how Thomas conceives how God and creatures are related to each other. Creatures are really related to God because there's something real in them, the means of which they are related to God. That's the act of existence. But there is nothing in God by means of which he is related to creatures. Okay. So that God doesn't change whenever creatures enter into that relationship with him, the relationship, you know, depending on him for um, our existence. So God remains the same. And this has sort of been coming out, you know, in discussing, you know, God's act of causation, God's knowledge, God's will, uh, and all the rest. And so it's all part of, you know, that that doctrine of mixed relations. Okay. So the question then is, could you just remind me of the question? It was to do with um, uh, the relation of time, wasn't it? It was uh, right. God and time. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, with that in place, then, um, what would be the account of time that I would defend? Well, in generally, it would be that Aristotelian view that time is the measurement of the before and after in a process of change. Um, so, I mean, on that, on that account, that that's what time is. You know, if you've got a process of change, you can distinguish some sort of succession in it and then point out the before and after, and then you've got, you know, arbitrary ways of measuring it. How are God and creatures related then? Well, they're related on the basis of that mixed relations. Creatures bear a real relationship to God. So any point in time at which they exist, they're dependent on God for their existence. But God doesn't bear a real relationship to creatures. So the being of creatures has no effect on God, in which case the temporality of creatures has no effect on God. So God remains atemporal, 
uh, whilst all the things that at any point in which they exist depend on God uh, for their existence. Um, if you had a non-Aristotelian view of time, you know, um, say, you know, you had sort of this block view of time, again, because, you know, God isn't really related to creatures, creatures are really related to God. God is not subject uh, to the being of creatures, so God is not subject, you know, to the temporal conditions of creatures. So that would be um, would be the general, you know, approach I would take to uh, God and time. Yeah, I think I think that uh, sort. I think I understand what's going on there, though. Um, there, I, if we had more time, I'd probably want to ask some follow up questions on the how that cool. could be a real relation one way and not the other but um I, I still want to actually get some some other questions that we had in here before we wrap up in a few minutes um mm -hmm. and I, actually i think jonathan had a question if he wanted to get in and ask it yeah the, they're they're very um quick questions that's why i wanted to kind of squeeze in um oh. Oh, hi again gavin <laughs> um, hey jonathan hi i was <laughs> i was thinking while other stuff was going on and there's there so much um stuff that I, I actually had another question about well, this is quickly a question about you were talking earlier about like um, Anscombe and Davidson. I was wondering and their views of intentionality and sort of this. I've, I've seen it attributed to Aristotle, this view that the act of like me pushing a rock consists in the rock being pushed by me. It consists in the patient. Yeah. I was wondering yeah. if you have like recommended books or readings to like learn more about that view. And then the other question yeah. is kind of relevant. So I'll yeah. let you answer first. Um, there's a lady called gloria frost um who's she works at i think it's in st paul minnesota but her name is gloria frost and she's got an article um it's something like you know the ontology of transient causality i think it is um i'm just typing here uh you know to, to find it um so i think it's the ontology of transient causality and in Aquinas, and so yeah, the on the ontology Aquinas is ontology of transient causal activity. Um, you know, I think you can find that on full papers. Um, so her name's Gloria Frost, and she she goes through a lot of the history, a lot of the background, a lot of the metaphysics of that. Um, she's got another article which is really good uh, related to this. Is um, it's on Aquinas and Scotus on uh, the origin. I think it's the origin of a contingency. Um, so. Just that, yeah, Aquinas and Scotus on the source of contingency. That's another related to the same sort of thing. So um, I, I I find that really illuminating. Okay, yeah, there there's somebody put it up um, in the questions. Um, I find that really illuminating, and you know, just outlining you know how Aquinas you know applied that Aristotelian view that the act of the agent is in the patient. Okay, yeah, thanks. I'll definitely have to check that out because I've heard a lot about the view, and I've I've kind of been interested in it because I think it helps with those modal collapse type objections to divine yeah, simplicity. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Th this other one's more of a personal question. So you could kind of choose to answer it or not. But I, one thing I've kind of thought about is when you think about the classical theist picture of God, it's not really starting with him as like a person, you know, like me and you or something like that. It's more starting with him as pure being. And then we can kind of mm -hmm. teach out intellect and will. And I, some people have said that this is a very like cold version of God and that they feel like when they pray to this, when they think of God this way, it's like, how could I, this is typically from like a uh, theistic personalist, like how could I pray to this God? And like, so I'm, I'm basically asking like, how is your view of divine simplicity and kind of going more into Aquinas's thought, how has it affected your personal, like spiritual relationship with God and how you pray to God? If that's something you're willing to answer, if that kind of makes sense as a question. That, of course, yeah. I mean, obviously, I mean, if I'm going to write this position, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I would have to take a position on that, you know, so I'm not shy about, you know, talking about that. One thing that always strikes me, you know, when this issue comes up, right, is, okay, yeah, I mean, it's a legitimate question and it deserves an answer. One thing that always kind of just strikes me, phenomenologically speaking, is that see, you know, so, see some of our kind of, you know, best representatives of classical theism, you know, the ones that just founded, you know, that whole outlook. Or the, the like the super saints, or the you know the, the the heroic saints in the tradition, the likes of Aquinas, Bonaventure, Albert. You know, they're these they're these people who were utterly devout, um, in in you know their pursuit of sanctity. So I mean, that's something to consider. That you know, 
the, the God that they're worshipping and, you know, sort of thinking about in both the philosophy and the theology, they see no distinction. Or if they do, you know, are they acting in some in, in bad faith in some sort of way? You know, rather than attribute bad faith to them or, you know, some sort of inconsistency, maybe, you know, um, we need to think, you know, maybe these men um, and, and women uh, sort of saw how all this hangs together in a certain way. So... You know, how, how do we address that then? How do we think about this God as, you know, the, the loving, you know, saving gods, you know, of you know, Catholicism? Because, you know, a lot of them are Catholic saints. First thing to say is that, um, you know, this God has properties, shall we say, because this God is intelligent, has a will, you know, will for the good and all the rest. Um, so this God does have personal properties. When one prays, God and when one enters into a relationship to God, at least if one is a Catholic, through Christ, through you know the person of Christ, um, that one enters into a relationship to God with God, and it's through Him then um, that God is revealed. And Christ, the second person of the Trinity, He's the Word made flesh. If one, if, if one's seeking to enter into a relationship with God, it's through Him that we enter into. It. And Christ, the the incarnation of Christ, is necessary. Precisely because what's unique about the Judeo-Christian view of God is that, as opposed to all the other different religious movements in the ancient world, the Judeo-Christian view, the God is lost somewhere and we're trying to find him. It's not God who's lost. We're the ones that are lost. We're the ones that are lost because of sin. It's from God and we lose ourselves and we can't find our true north because we have the darkening of the intellect. And and we just don't know the presence of God. Any. So there is that sense of being lost. And so the hope then uh, of Israel and then, you know, fulfilled in, in Christianity is that God comes to find us, that God is the one who undertakes the rescue operation. And that's in, you know, right in Genesis in the early chapter, in chapter three, the Proto-Evangelion, that God is going to fix things, that humans can't fix it. God's going to be the one that does it. <coughs> and this is the hope of Israel. And then this is the, the fulfillment of that hope in Christ. So acting like a good shepherd, God is the one that comes uh, re and reveals himself to us, returns us to him. So we have this desire to return to God. That desire is only fulfilled in Christ. A God, now, in desiring to return to God, we seek to worship God. The only, prob the, the only appropriate worship that we can give to God is the worship that God shows us to give to him. And that's the worship that Christ gives to God. This worship is sacramental. So in order to worship God, to enter into a spiritual relationship with God, we do that through Christ in the sacraments. So when I come to meet God, it's not sitting, thinking about God as pure existence itself and all the rest. That's what he is that. But he reveals himself to me as triune. Somebody who's seeking to return, as the good shepherd, somebody seeking to return me to him, taking every step, being pure existence itself, omnipotent, omniscient, you know, all loving, doing what he can as that, return me to him and to bring me into communion with him. So when I enter into a relationship with God through Christ and, you know, indeed through the Holy Spirit, um, I do so knowing that this God of classical theism, with all his resources as pure existence itself, seeks to, you know, draw me into to a relationship um, simply for the fact um, that he loves me because I'm a manifestation of the divine essence, which is the good and which is the good itself. Furthermore, um, God loves me not because, as, as we've seen, not because he sees any sort of intelligible species in me that he understands. He loves me. He knows and he loves me in terms of seeing himself and seeing me reflected in himself. I'm a manifestation of his divine essence. Given that he loves himself eternally and in eternally loving himself loves me, there's nothing at all that I can do to cause him to stop loving me. Rather, anything that I do in that respect which is, forces me to stop loving him turns me away from him, but there's nothing that I can do to kind of, you know, cause him to stop loving me. So even in the deepest sort of sins and situations I find myself in, God is always present, loving me, and at every moment seeking to, you know, 
Aunt Me Grace pouring grace over me so that some of that may find its way in and then I can make my return to him, you know, through the sacraments and through Christ so that, um, you know, when I die then, I'll die in love with him. Um, so that's kind of how I approach that um, whole issue of, you know, how could one come to worship the, this God of classical theism? Well, I mean, we, we do so because, you know, he reveals himself to us in Christ and all of that is consistent. If they, you know this stuff on classical theism, um, how, how does that sound, Jonathan? Just to yeah, that, that's yeah, it sounds amazing, and I and I, I definitely think it highlights the incarnation even more so because on this view, uh, God wouldn't have emotions in the way we have emotions, um, so that kind of motivates the incarnation more because in the incarnation, Christ re can uh, sort of know, kind of know, He knows what it's like to be a human, and and I think. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Is that in the incarnation, it kind of highlights the incarnation more because he becomes a man and things like that? It hi highlights the incarnation. Into, I mean, I don't tend to focus on that whole whole idea that God knows what it's like to be a human. Um, I, I kind of focus more on that um, God sets two feet on the dusty earth in order to reveal himself to humans so that humans can come to know him uh, and enter into a relationship with him. That, that that's where I situate the incarnation that, uh, you know, it's, it's a further revelation of himself. Yeah, that, yeah, that's, yeah, I appreciate that answer. I can't really say much to it, but I, I will <laughs> say uh, I'm much more comfortable in the hands of the classical theist God than I am in the hands of like Jonathan Edwards, God who like is literally right. at us and literally we're in his hand and he's going to remove his hand and we're all going to fall to hell. Side. Right. That's right. Okay, thank you. All right. I think actually that's probably a good place to uh, wrap it up. Um, so that will be the end of the questions. Thank you so much for taking the time to yep. answer all of our questions and discuss these things. It's been brought up a lot of great and interesting views and issues that, uh, that uh. people have found rewarding. Right. Yeah. No, it was great. Thanks for the questions. And you know, I mean, these questions are being fielded, you know, all over the place and are rising up in the literature. So, you know, it's, it's really good. You know, it's a great community that you have, which are raising these questions. So I really enjoyed it. Thanks for letting me come on and have the discussion. Yeah, thanks so much. And, and if any, if at any point you want, you know, you'd be open to come on again sometime down the line, because I think a lot of people are you know, coming across some of these issues for the first time and are looking mm -hmm. into some of the things you reference and may have some follow ups on that. If you'd be able yeah. to do something like this again, that'd be great. Yeah, always happy to do this sort of stuff. Yeah, be cool.